Psych Sessions, Conversations About Teaching and Stuff. I'm Eric Lander, along with Garth Neufeld, your podcast hosts. As the name implies, we center on conversations about teaching, but we often veer into other interesting topics, which is the end stuff. This is episode number 61, where Garth and I had the opportunity to interview Jason Spiegelman from the Community College of Baltimore County in Baltimore, Maryland. Now, before you hear the interview, please allow me to share some listening tips and some of my favorite moments. Garth and I want to express our thanks to the Eastern Psychological Association for providing space for psych sessions to record this podcast. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts because that helps us pop in the search results. And while you're there, ratings help us too. Or you can download from Google Podcasts, Spotify, and other locations. Now, in talking to... Jason, it was an absolute blast. He listed off the other places where uh, CCBC has locations. And I got to tell you, he said them so fast. They sounded like Game of Thrones locations. It was awesome. Um, Jason Spiegelman loves teaching introductory psychology. And a lot of us love the course. We love the content. We love the experience. We love sharing it with our students. He really loves it. And I'm not going to say any more about that. I'm going to let you listen to the joy in his voice, in his heart when he talks about that. He talks about how he keeps it fresh as well. He has these classic examples like for stimulus generalization that he shares from semester to semester. I think all of us who teach that class probably have some classics. And uh, he tells the he tells the short form of that story on the podcast, which is awesome. Um, he shares a little bit about the the chairperson position at EPA for the teaching division, uh, both in uh, a little bit in the middle of the podcast. And again, he circles back to it at the end of the podcast. Um, and he tells a little bit about the back, his backstory about uh, starting at Bucknell, uh, transferring then to the University of Pittsburgh, uh, master's work at Pepperdine, and then some uh, doctoral work at the University of Akron. Um I really liked that um, Jason was just so open and honest about his uh, background, about his academic journey. Uh, he shared with about his mother and father, which is you know kind of typical for you know the origin story. Um, I, I'm hesitating a bit because it's part of, part of this is my fault. I kind of go down a path with a lot of our guests on psych sessions, and if you're a regular listener, you understand this and. I'm I'm trying to soften my approach, but you know, there's a pattern that that Garth and I see with a lot of of our dear friends and our interviewees on psych sessions about uh, whether it's self deprecating humor or um, you know chalking up really amazing accomplishments to luck or others as opposed to taking a bow and taking credit, and that was a theme that came up here again, and I think. The three of us had a really important conversation. I'm just glad it was captured by microphones, quite honestly, uh, about uh, why why we tend to do that and and how um, how I I'm trying to get better myself. I'm and I'm never trying to be critical of our guests. I'm, I just tried to sometimes help people see how how that uh, imposter phenomenon hurts ourselves and how I'm trying to improve and how I have people in my life helping me to improve, which I'm always thankful for. And so we spend a little bit of time about that. We talked about how Jason got hooked on changing his major uh, while he was in college and how his mother was in, was insightful and important about that. Um, kind of ended the podcast talking about the changing nature of the textbook publishing industry uh, and, and his role that he has played for multiple publishers of intrapsych textbooks with regard to supplement writing, whether it's test item files or instructor's manuals or PowerPoint uh, pre-made templates and things like that. And so it was really a whirlwind conversation. It was lovely. It was awesome. You know, he was busy in his first uh, role as teaching chair. And so Garth and I just really appreciated the time with him. And uh, I, you know, as I tend to say at the end of these things, we really hope that you enjoy uh, listening to this um, conversation as much as we enjoyed recording it. Welcome to another episode of Psych Sessions. I just stole the intro from Eric. This is so cool to be here in person. Hey, Garth. Hey, who are we with here? <laughs> uh, we are with Jason Spiegelman from Community College of Baltimore County. That's right. And uh, you guys have a few campuses, right? That's right. We have three main campuses uh, in on the outskirts of Baltimore, Catonsville, Essex, and Dundalk, as well as several 
smaller extension centers. So we serve the entire Baltimore County community. Are you guys like into expansion? Is that what you're doing? You're, you're trying to uh, grab other places? So they were. Uh, several years ago, they added some of these uh, centers based on needs in the local community. But uh, I don't think right now they're, they're, they're doing that quite as much. They're working some partnerships with local businesses and companies, but um, we're not building new campuses currently. And how long have you been there? Oh, geez. Uh, part-time and full-time, coming up on 16 or 17 years. Full-time, uh, almost 15 years. And is there a tenure system there? Are you tenured? Are you a chair? What, what's the deal? So I'm just a, a, a professor. Just. Um, yeah, Listen just. to that. Oh, I'm a, just a, a, a professor. So the way it works at CCBC is I describe it as kind of a tenurific system. Uh, it's, it's, it's called a one 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 three five. For your first three years, you get a one-year contract each year. And then if they still like you, you get a three-year contract. And then after that, you get a five-year contract. And then for the rest of your career, every five years, you renew your five-year contract. So we no longer have tenure. Um, but the truth is, by the time you get to your five-year contract, it's not tenure, but you've been vested in the college long enough, and they're kind of vested in you. So there's sort of an understood commitment. Um, it's just like tenure. Anybody can be fired at any time or released as necessary. Right. But you know, once you've been there a certain number of years, there's uh, the illusion of job security, I suppose. What do you teach uh, mostly? Uh, so my bread and butter is intro. I teach an awful lot of intro. Um, and that has been the course that I've really gravitated to for my entire teaching career. Uh, I also teach abnormal psychology. Uh, I've taught uh, developmental psych, um, social psych, uh, advanced psychopathology at the graduate level years ago. Um, but those, those are the four courses that I teach most regularly and most frequently intro and abnormal. Tell us about your intro psych. You teach in large sections, small sections, online sections, hybrid, face-to-face? -face? So I teach uh, ex currently exclusively face-to-face. -face. Um, okay. I really um, I have a lot of respect for people who teach online, and I, I have not taken the leap to kind of learn the different role of the teacher in an online course. But for my own personality, I really need to be there with my students. I need to be face-to-face -face with them and interacting. Um, so I teach exclusively face-to-face. Uh, at CCBC, we do not have the large, you know, multi-hundred student sections. For a, a long time, our students, our classes were capped at 36. Um, with our enrollment taking a little bit of a hit, which is sort of the national um, right. Uh, movement right now, um, we're we're seeing a little bit lower class size. This this semester, I have classes between 20 and 30. Uh, my abnormal psych class right now is at about 22. Um, so, you know, if you go back 10 years, I would report that my classes were maxed out 36 across all sections, and uh, we haven't seen that um, uh, in, in quite a few years. What year? I'm, so, I'm sorry. Uh, are you teaching like a 4-4, four, 5-5? Four, five, five? What's the typical load? So the, the load at CCBC is that full-time instructors are expected to teach five courses in the fall and five courses in the spring. We do not, we're not required to teach a January course, though you can if you want to teach an overload. We're not required to teach in the summer, but you can if you want to teach extra. And in the fall and spring, you're allowed to pick up extra sections if you want to, to earn a little extra adjunct pay as well. With the um, with the decrease in enrollments, is there an uh, interest in, so rather than teach two sections of 20, is there the threat? We're just going to combine those. And we're going to have you teach one section of 40. It's an interesting question because one of the things I was speaking with um, very recently, as a matter of fact, with some of the administration is the idea that um, perhaps they want to reduce our reliance on our adjunct faculty. Uh, and one of the ways of doing that might be to um, compress some of the sections, offer fewer sections, and hope that the ones that are retained will have a, a higher student count. That's well above my pay grade, but um, for right now, they haven't done that. There's, they still have a minimum enrollment before they'll let the class make, as they say, um, but they have not really started significantly reducing sections a little bit, but um, retrenching them down to a significantly smaller number has not yet happened. And I think that if enrollment continues to decline, again, not just at CCBC, but across the country, at, uh, particularly community colleges, we'll probably see that uh, into the strategy soon. Are you guys a union shop? No. Okay. Gotcha. Um, how, many, how many sections of Psych 100 are you teaching out of, out of your five classes? In a semester? It depends on the semester. This past fall, I taught five. Okay. Um, which uh, some 
some of my colleagues at, at NITOP and, and various uh, organizations, they look at me and they say, seriously, how can you possibly stomach teaching five intros? And I say to them, I love it. It's, it's, it really is the course that I get my most energy from. This semester I'm teaching four intros in an abnormal. Uh, it might be um, three and two. So it, it really depends largely on the needs of the college. But as one of the faculty members who... Um, I don't want to speak for all of all of the psych faculty across all the campuses because I don't know, but I think I'm one of the very few who only teaches face to face. I'm also one of the few who embraces teaching at eight o'clock in the morning. So um, I have been teaching uh, a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, eight essentially eight to nine, nine to ten, ten to eleven, eleven to twelve, four sections consecutively for several years now. Um, and that's worked out quite well because many of our other faculty either don't want to teach at those times or are teaching online at those times. Um, so it works out very neatly and that what I'm willing to do with the college needs. Uh, when they say, we need you to teach something else, I'll teach something else. Wait, wait, okay, time out. Time I know, you look right. like you look like somebody just punched you right. in the face. Ta okay, well, hey, that's how I look, dude. That's not very <laughs> nice, all right? So time out. So back to back to back to back. Yes. 8, 9, 10, and 11. Well, it's truly 8, 9, 0, 5, 10, 10, and 11, 15. Okay, but that's yes. even more bizarre, but yeah. okay, I get it. You well, it's have, a 55-minute class with a 10-minute time. In them. Yes, all right. Yes. Uh, mo Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Correct. Tuesday, Thursday. Uh, no, just Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and oh, that's just th those. There's uh, another just. Those are my four of my classes, and then my fifth, I'll typically pick up either a Tuesday or a Thursday oh. night three hour course. What are you doing? At least keep it Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Well, that uh, fifth uh, course, I I could do that, but four hours is about as much as I can do. So yeah, could, you, could I do a fifth? Yes, I just don't really. Yeah, but want just to. do it in the afternoon so you could not come to campus on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Well, it doesn't work that way either because there's committee meetings and other you know, contributions. So Jason, wait, I. I I got to explore this with you for a second. Tell us why you love intro psych that much. I mean, I love intro psych. Garth loves intro psych. Regan Gurung lo loves intro psych. But he doesn't teach it four times back to back to back to back. Well, th there's a very simple explanation for that. Y you are all quite a bit smarter than I am. No, no, <laughs> no. That, 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 that's not the explanation. Not and that's not that? true. Oh, well, okay. I'm, and I'm going to jump in because I'm wondering if we're stumbling uh, onto a, a little bit of a community college thing here because okay, uh, this is this is not abnormal for a community college instructor to teach maybe to teach back to back to back to back oh, I, in the way Jason oh, does it. I don't think a 5-5 five five is abnormal but the love of intro psych well, that, to that necessity. degree that's what enrolls I, 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 I agree that the need is there to teach it but the love of it Got I it. think is unusual although I don't know that I don't. I don't know that. Does that's, he really love it? Let's. Yeah, let's that's know. that's what I want to know. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Why? And, and, you know, Why? The, well, you know, it's. I Please. I like the idea that I'm getting in with students, most of whom are taking that course not out of choice but out of obligation, and I start all of my intro classes the same way. Why are you? We, we review the syllabus, of course, because why would I count on them to read it? And then I ask them, Why are you here? And I answer the question for them. I say, now, for 95% of you, the answer is probably because somebody told you that you have to take this course. And all of the heads nod. And, you know, for some of you, you probably really don't want to be here. And some of the heads nod. Um, and then for, you know, maybe 5% of them, they chose the course. Um, but I really like the idea. For me, the challenge is the student who either does not want to be there, vehemently does not want to be there, um, or the student who has no idea what this course is going to be about, and they're there because somebody told them they had to be. For me, the challenge is I give myself 30 days. And in that first 30 days, can I go back to that student who said, I really don't want to be here, and say to them, how are you feeling about it now? And if the student can say to me, I'm, I'm, I'm digging the course, or it's, it's, how about this, it's not as bad as I thought it would be, which is about as backhand a compliment as you can get. Or the student who says, I had no idea what we were going to be talking about in here, but I'm, I'm really interested in this now. To me, that's the victory. Uh, if they're doing well, that's even better. But being able to tell them, have them tell me, I had no idea what we were going to be talking about in this class. I had no idea that this was what psychology was. And then later, at the end of the semester, maybe that student comes back and says, I think I want to take another psychology course. And I just think to myself, I, I earned my salary in this course. Do you check in with them at 30 days? Yes, I do. I check in with them a number of ways. Um, one of the ways I do is on the first exam, I always give them a few extra credit questions, as many of us do. And one of the extra credit questions on the very first test is, for one free bonus point, give me an evaluation of the course so far. 
And I explain to them, you can be complimentary. I love hearing compliments. You can be critical. I love hearing critical feedback. Just be respectful. Um, and if there's something that you're digging, tell me. If there's something that you're really hating or something I'm doing or something about the class that's getting in your way, please tell me. Because what's the point of an evaluation after the course is over? That might help the next section, but it doesn't help me do a better job here. And I'll tell them, as part of that evaluation, please tell me if this course is you know, something that you didn't think it was going to be, better than you thought, is it more interesting, less interesting. So I try to solicit that. It's not anonymous, of course. Um, I do some anonymous feedback as well. Tell them you can always you know, leave me a note or send me an email from whatever, leave me a voicemail. Um, but I do try to check in with them pretty regularly and just you know, keep a, a finger on the pulse of the class. The brilliant thing about uh, giving your students an opportunity to give you that kind of feedback is not only do you hear from them, mm -hmm. but I'm guessing what they give you, you've seen it before. Oh, yeah. But yeah. for them, it's, uh, it's you letting them know that you care about their experience. Absolutely. They have a voice, yeah. yeah. And, and, and it, it's not good enough to just solicit the feedback. Then it's very necessary, the next class, to say, okay, I've read over the evaluations, and let me tell you what you all told me. Um, invariably, the evaluations are almost all positive, and I tell them, I don't believe you. Okay, I believe some of you have some critical things to say, but you knew it wasn't anonymous and you thought I'd get angry at you. I'm sorry if you thought that. You were wrong. I won't get angry at you. But let me tell you what you all said. And let me here's some feedback that I really appreciate, but I can't do anything about. For example, somebody said the course is too early in the morning. Well, why'd you sign up for an 8 a.m. class if you don't like 8 a.m. classes? I, I can do nothing about that. I'm sorry it's too early for you, but that's outside of my control. Um, students said, uh, four or five of you said, we'd like to have tests after, after every chapter. I hear you. I agree. I'd like to do that too. We don't have time. I can't give 14 days of class for exams. But I want you to know that I read what you said. Um, somebody else said, I wish we had more class participation. That's really good stuff. Let, let me see what I can do to make you all participate more. I'm going to throw it back at them. But I want them to know they have a voice and their voice has been heard. Even if I can't give them what That's they right. want, it's important that they know that I wasn't just making them write for the sake of writing. It's a really powerful technique. It, it helps diffuse what could be volatile situations, and it, help, it helps them feel like they're part of the class, and they, they, can, they can shape their own destiny if they're, that you're listening to them. It's really powerful. Have you done the, uh, the whole counting game uh, of how many sections of intro psych you've ever taught in your career? Oh, I, I have Ballpark. not. Ballpark? Uh, and the number of students that you've taught, because I do right. that from time to time. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting because when I hear people talking about I've I've taught eighteen thousand students yeah. in my career, mm -hmm. or I've taught twenty thousand students, I think it's not a level play. And it, number one, it's not a competition. Right. Number two, it's not a level competition because if you're teaching five hundred and I've got my twenty three, uh, it'll never happen. But um, oh, I I haven't. Um, but my guess would be um, probably approaching um, one hundred eighty two hundred sections. Um, and it, because I have taught at the you know the 300 student section from time to time, uh, I, I teach mostly smaller classes. I would say you know well into the thousands. How do you keep things uh, fresh? Because I could imagine that you would just you could almost go on automatic at at this point. Even some of the things that you're saying here, I can just I see you very clearly in the classroom when you're saying these things. Mm -hmm. These are things that. Uh, are, are have just been memorized. But yeah, the fourth time, hour right? of the day. It's robotic, yeah. Every right. every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, the fourth hour of the day, you've got to be you got to be having an ice pick to your head. Yeah, the fourth class I've is said the this hardest. three times yeah. this morning already. It, 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 so I don't even use a lecture note anymore. I mean, as you said, it's all up here. You do it so often that you, you just don't need that anymore. And somebody the other day said, well, you only have one prep. I said, no, I don't have any preps. I don't have to prep this course anymore. I've taught it so many times. But what really keeps it fresh is not the, the content that we're going to you know, regurgitate over and over again, but it's, it's finding a way to make it meaningful in a fresh kind of way. So a new life experience. Yesterday, one of my kids did this, and let me tell you how that demonstrates this concept. Or um, this was on the internet this morning, and let's pull it up and watch that video as an example. Um, just the other day, somebody posted in the STP Facebook group um, uh, about uh, John Oliver and his 20-minute YouTube clip on the, the nonsense of psychics and mediums. Right. And, yeah. and I thought that was fascinating. And when I was driving somewhere, I put it on, and I just listened to it. And I thought, this is great. And I went in the next day, and I showed it in my class. And a student said, how do you find this stuff? And I said, well, that's the beauty. And I tell them, the beauty of my life is, without exception, 
every single day something happens that I will be able to use in one of my psychology courses. Um, so I just kind of keep a mental notebook of, you know, what did my kids say? What did my wife say? What kind of moronic thing did I do the other day that I'm going to be able to come in and say, and here's an example. Um, some of the examples are so classic that I just recycle them semester by semester by sure. semester. And some of the stories my students I'm famous for, they'll come back to me a year later in another class and say, are you going to tell that story in this class? I hadn't planned on it. Can you? Yes, I can tell that story again. Um, but the way I keep it fresh is to just make sure that everyday experiences are peppered in there so that the students are getting application of the concepts. So do you have a couple of classic stories that every year students want to make sure that you tell? Do you have uh, one or two? That... So stimulus generalization. Why don't, do you mind telling that story for our listeners? Do you want the full version or the brief version? Uh, what's the more entertaining version? Well, let's do the brief version. Okay. Uh, the brief version is it was 1999 and we partied like it was. Yeah, see, none of them even get that reference thank you, anymore. Thank you, Prince. Yeah, none of them even get that reference anymore. Do you remember Prince, Garth? I've seen Prince. Have you? Not Prince Henry. Yeah, oh, oh thank yeah, you. Yeah, oh, okay. my God, I yeah. love this. Okay. This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. No, that's okay. Am I getting made fun of for being young? Yes. Yeah, I think so. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah, you and your hair bun can just sit back and listen to this story. I've seen Prince in concert. It was one of the best concerts I'll I've bet ever it was. seen. Yeah. Yeah. I'll bet it was. So it was 1999, and I was living in, of all places, Akron, Ohio. Have you ever been to Akron? I have not. Yeah, don't go there. It's 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 the city that where dreams go to but die. Isn't that where the history... It, it is. Is. Yes, it is. Dave, David Baker at the University of Akron. So we do have to go there. Yeah. At David Baker is yeah. outstanding. Hello, David. Um, so I was living there, and I was I was, I was dating a, a quite nice woman named Debbie. And um, hi, Debbie. Debbie and I, <laughs> Debbie and I were. Uh, we can edit that part out. No, you can say hi to Debbie. Um, we were wasting time at the mall one day, and, and she took me into a store that I didn't want to be in. I'm giving you the pared down version. And after about ten minutes of this, uh, maybe thirty seconds of this nonsense, I said to her, "Honey, I, I don't want to be here. I'm going to go over to Radio Shack because that's where you would go in the day." Dreams go to live. That's right. What's Radio Shack? Oh God. <laughs> okay, go ahead. It's, it, it's <laughs> it, they got switches and batteries and stuff. <laughs> Yes, man oh, stuff. Tim right? Tool Man Taylor. That's right. So I said to her, I'm, I'm going to go um, to Radio Shack because I don't want to be in here. And she said, fine, I'll meet you down in, in this other store in 10 minutes. I want to buy something. And 10 minutes later, I walked down and she's there already and she's looking up on the shelf. And she's and I walked up behind her and I tell, I, I really draw this out. I said, now you have to understand something. She and I had been together for a couple of years and I had certain privileges. That pregnant pause is very important. I had certain privileges. So I walked up behind her, and because I was allowed to, and because I wanted to, and it seemed like the right thing to do, I just gave her a little, you know, <clears throat> you know a little, a little pat on the fanny, right? And then she turns around, and I realize that it's not Debbie. And the students just look at me, and their faces fall. And I say, and this woman hit me so hard, I start speaking in an Australian accent. And they, 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 they tell me, you made that story up. I said, no, I didn't make that story up. I, I assaulted a woman so that someday I could teach you all about stimulus generalization. And they say, what happened when Debbie got there? I said, she slapped the other side of my face. And they, that was a joke, of course. But you know, I, I, I do the story with an awful lot of drama, and the students are in hysterics. And then, again, a couple of years ago, a student was taking a, a next class of mine, and she said, are you going to tell the story where you grabbed the wrong woman's ass? I was like, I, I wasn't going to. Can you? Yes, I can tell the story. So that's just a classic example of something that students uh, students like listening to. Well, and I, I think there's a couple there's a couple layers in there that I really appreciate. One is that you are communicating the concept uh, accurately, and secondly, you're embedding it in a story that's going to be memorable. Yeah. So odds are, not only do they want you to they beg you to tell the story because it's a good story, but hopefully they're going to remember the concept. Right. And they're going to be remember it. And th that may, 10 years from now, when you ask them, what do you remember from intro psych? That might be the thing. Yeah. And that's okay that they actually come away, you know, what did, what did he cover in intro psych? I'm doing this with air quotes because I hate the word coverage. What did he cover? Well, that's something that they actually remember from intro psych. And sure. So, and it's, it's applicable to them. And then I ask them to come up with, have you ever made such a mistake? Like, right. have you ever been out in public and you waved at a friend of yours and then, then they looked up and you realized it wasn't them and you were waving at the wrong person? There's generalization. Right. Um, I give them, a, I tell them the story about my cat, Lucy, um, who, when I first brought her home, just to see what would happen, I tried to shape her to the sound of the can opener. 
um, for her cat food. Uh, and then after she was properly conditioned, then I extinguished her by not giving her any more cat food. Um, and, you know, I, I make that story much longer than it needs to be because they're really engaged with it. And, and later on, they say, you know, they'll come in, they'll say, how's Lucy? They'll ask me later on semester, how's the cat doing? And then a student years ago, uh, after she was no longer my student by a couple semesters, she actually ended up babysitting for my wife and I. And she came into the house and she looked down and the cat was in. And she said, is that the cat? I said, yes. What's her name? She said, that's Lucy. Well, the fact that you remember my cat's name. Yeah. If that's all you got out of my course, then maybe I'm not such a good teacher. But that kind of thing. No, well, that's, that's an important point, though, because I think sometimes <coughs> our stories, we become such good storytellers yeah. uh, in in teaching as much as we do, that uh, you you don't want to miss that opportunity to make the connection back to the content, right? Right. Because uh, it it would be a shame if if all they get was Lucy, then we've we've missed this opportunity, right? If they, if they have right, and, and that's the that's the piece where the the story has to be connected to the content, right? Just like in advertising, everybody knows right. Aflac, but how many of our students actually know what Aflac is? Right. Everybody knows the Geico Gecko. Uh, but how many of them know right. what Geico is? So I give them I give them those examples as well of if you remember the pitch but not the product, then it's probably bad. If they remember Lucy but not why we talked about Lucy, it's not a good thing. And Jeff Nevid um, spoke about this uh, a couple of years ago at NITOP. He talked about, don't teach me a concept, tell me a story. And he did a whole presentation, uh, and it really resonated a lot of my class's storytelling. Um, and I listen, they can read the definition in the textbook. They do not need me to read the textbook to them. I need to give them applicable examples and then ask them to come up with those for themselves. That's the big piece I picked up on what you were just saying is that you, you force them to take that story, to take that concept right. and then to apply it to their own lives. Right. And I think that that's really difficult for uh, for students to do. I think the literature tells us that that's difficult for students to do. Well, it's also, I mean, if you look at the literature in terms of memory, now we're getting into deeper processing, and they're going to be really internalizing that information rather than just trying to read and memorize and then regurgitate on an exam. So, Jason, tell us a little bit about the role that you play here at EPA. So this is my first year as chair for the teaching division of the EPA annual meeting. And so the, the role encompasses reviewing all of the submissions, uh, ensuring that uh, we're accepting the ones that are appropriate for this particular division of the conference, and then, of course, building the schedule, um, getting a keynote, um, and then on site, you know, ensuring that everything is, is, is going the right way, assigning chairs to each section. And so that was my role. And then over the course of the next 12 months, I'm going to be uh, working with Garth as well as some of the other regional um, conference chairs and teaching to see what I can do to sort of ramp up the, the teaching energy here for EPA. I think there's there's either thir 13 or 14 different sections uh, at this conference. Okay. There's, there's cognitive, there's behavioral neuro, there's applied, there's all kinds of great things. And teaching t to me feels a little bit, um, the energy for teaching is a little bit lower at this conference. It's not a TOP conference, and nor should it be. But I think that there are things that we can do to up the energy, and we're going to be having our uh, our committee meeting tomorrow, then I'm going to bring some ideas out for what I'd like to do uh, while I have this position to see if we can't get more teaching energy for EPA. Does anything occur to you off the top of your head that you would like to set for goals or things that you'll be sharing tomorrow? And no pressure. No, it's fine. Um, one of the things that I, I, again, being new in the role, I believe that when you're new in a role, you need to listen first and then affect change. Uh, a new incoming college president should spend their first year listening. A new VPI should listen and then make motions. So I wanted to spend the first year doing what had been done and just kind of learning it before I made any changes. So one of the things I'm going to recommend or, or I, I guess ask permission for is are, are we allowed to, at this particular conference, have people come in to do presentations that are more experiential and less, less SOTL, less research-based, or is everything supposed to be based on research? Um, I can think of taking it sort of a little in the NITOP direction where a lot of the presentations are more what are we doing rather than what does the research tell us. You know, not to say that research shouldn't back up what we're doing, but I don't want to see every presentation have to be this is the data that we collected and here is the analysis that we did. I'd like to see the TOP part of this be a little bit more of that. Um, I want to build in some more space for community college teachers because I find there to be very few here. Uh, and I think uh, perhaps EPA has not really marketed itself to the community college faculty. Perhaps they feel like this is not the right place for them. And maybe it's not, but maybe we can change that, and it can be. I want to build some space for that. I've also been talking to Marianne Fallon uh, at SciKai um, about starting, starting to look for some SciKai-Sci-Beta collaboration mm -hmm. 
along with the teaching uh, division as well, because that's where we're going to get to some more community college uh, access to the conference. So those are some ideas that I have right off the top of my head. We also spoke at a, uh, a division chair's uh, telephone conference a couple weeks ago about some more demonstration type um, sessions. Um, where people will get up and actually demonstrate something that they do in class. And instead of 20 minutes, maybe we give everybody 10, and we have six in an hour rather than four or eight. Um, so those are some ideas that might draw some more teaching energy to the conference. Yeah, it's a nice programming note to uh, to be more, to open up the opportunities for more people yeah. to be involved in something like giving demonstrations yeah. or like classroom techniques or something like and that. And that's a model that works at other conferences. So at Rocky Mountain Psychological Association, they'll oftentimes have like a demo demo right. like you would see at uh, Night Top right. where it'll be an hour and there'll be either five or ten minute demonstrations mm -hmm. and there'll be six or eight of them. Right. And it actually, it's a really nice opening session. We'll go do that and it kind of, it gets the teaching energy going yeah. and they're not all data-based. It's a it's a room full of people, and they're bringing handouts, and you know, and so it kind of gets the the opening vibe going. And, and here, here, I'm sorry. Here, no. Here's what I did in my class, and it works for me. Right. And uh, if you like it, use it. If you don't, that's okay too. Right. But your thing in conferences, Eric, is w one thing, right? Uh, one good idea. One OGI. good idea. Yeah. Yeah. That that's when you go to a conference. It's like Eric's best practices. You're looking for one. If I can go good home idea. with one good idea, I'm happy because one good idea is hard to come by. And I think this applies really nicely to something like those demonstrations because I I know that you can sit out in the audience and watch six or eight of these and feel overwhelmed yeah. by because they come so fast at you and yeah. um. But if, even if you found one in those demonstrations uh, that oh, could work for your classroom or that resonates with you, I think it's a I think it's a reasonable goal. I think it's a great goal is to go for one. At NITOP, uh, it's got to be three or four years ago. Um, Doug Bernstein um, did part of I think it was at the at the initial demo demo or the teaching slam, whichever one it was, and and he stood up and he he did a little thing where he spoke to somebody in French. And they followed his instruction. He asked them to stand up. And then he, I think in French, asked her to sit down. And then he went through the entire neurology of language perception and then routing from the ears to the brain and then routing back to the motivational centers to follow the instruction, then routing to the frontal cortex to, to generate a, a voluntary movement in the motor cortex and then to stand up. And, and I thought it was brilliant. So I do this with my students, uh, and I say to them, if you don't know what psychology is about, would you all stand up? And the whole class stands up, and then would you all sit down? And they all sit down. And I can turn that into a 10-minute discussion on everything he just did. I can talk about uh, obedience. You know, Why did you all do what I said to do, even though you really didn't have to stand up? Um, or is it compliance? Do I have the authority to force you to stand up? Um, and so that was one that I took away from my top, the, the one great idea. Mm -hmm. And I'm still using it uh, four or five years later. So I'll take notes, and I tell people sometimes, you know, don't try to do more than two or three new things. But you right. know, one is enough to completely change the face of your class. And plus, you know, you, you come away with something that you feel like it was worth the trip. Yeah. I mean, I, I saw Dave Myers, uh, 1991-92 at Nightop do some demos, you know, as he was writing his intro psych textbook that I came away with I did of uh, ESP that I did an intro for 20 years teaching uh, that I, that students that was my thing that students would cut. Are you going to do the card trick thing? Mm -hmm. Are you going to do the ESP demo? You know that I did with nieces and nephews and family members. You know forever. I mean, one good idea can really get you a lot of mileage. Kind of like my story about uh, accosting a woman in a store. If they, if they right. remember that twenty years from now and they remember what the point of the story was, exactly. then then we've educated. And it is, it, I know that most of my students are not going to be psych majors. That's not the that's not the institution right. that I'm at. I'm at a two year institution. We don't even have a psych major. Um, so you know, and I'll tell them. I, I could care less if in six months from now you remember what an id, ego, and superego is. I don't care if you remember what OCEAN stands for. What I care is when you are done with this class, can you think more critically and at a higher level when you are given information? And if you can be a better consumer and a better analyzer of information, if you can do a better job with your critical thinking, then I've done my job. And if you get an A, that's just a bonus. Right. I know we're talking about e, uh, EPA. That's where yeah. we are. Um, topic. <laughs> I know that we're talking about EPA right now, but 
Tell me about your students, because uh, we never really heard about who your students are, okay. and I find that a fascinating question for everybody, but at, at a community college level in particular, I have mm-hmm. an interest in it, of course. We have an extremely diverse range of students. Um, uh, more of my students than not are uh, what we might call minorities, which uh, we heard yesterday about the majority, or the other night about the majority minority when Jennifer Richardson was speaking. Um, so most of my students are non-white, um, and the spread across the different racial ethnic groups is, is quite diverse. Um, we range from African American, Asian American, Middle Eastern, Orthodox Jewish. We have a lot of Orthodox Jewish students because we have a large Jewish community in Baltimore. Um, our age range is from 13 up to 80. I have, I've had 13-year-old students in my class, and I have had 80-year-old students in my class. And y- your eyes went up at the 13-year-old. It, it was truly a Doogie Hauser moment. He graduated from college when he was 14. Uh, excuse me. He graduated from community college when he was 14 and then went on to a four-year institution to study astrophysics. Uh, and he came back to see me two years later. He just stopped by my office one day, and he had grown up a few inches. And he said, do you remember me? And I said, yeah, you got taller. What are you doing now? I was like, well... I'm finishing my bachelor's in astrophysics, and I just, I just, I held my head in my hands. I said, "Oh my God, I'm so stupid. This kid is Doogie Howser. It's incredible." Um, so you know, we have an awful lot of non-traditional students. We have students who are working full-time jobs and are trying to be full-time parents, and also trying to be full-time students, which of course does not work. Um, we have students who are very academically able and prepared, and we have students who have a lot of academic and preparation struggles. So. We have the whole spectrum along every dimension you could imagine. Interesting. I, so, so, Jason, I want to switch gears a little bit. So tell us about, um, were you always going to go to college? Was, were mom and dad going to, was it ever a, if are you going to college or what college are you going to go to? Did they go to college? Tell us a little bit about your origin story, if you don't mind. Sure. So I grew up in Pittsburgh. Um, okay. And uh, a Steeler fan. A Steeler fan. Yes, okay. it's a little difficult these days. Terrible towel. Uh, the terrible Myron Cope and the terrible towel. Okay. Um, it, 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 both of my parents were college graduates. My father was an engineer, uh, and my mother uh, was a uh, library technical librarian. Um, and they both worked at Westinghouse for a number of years in the same building for for many many years. Um, the answer to your question is it, it was really never a question of whether or not I was going to college. I mean, they never said to me, do you want to go to college? Right. It was where do you think you want to go to college or what do you want to do in college? College was assumed. And this okay. is something that I discussed with my students in terms of privilege. Um, it, it, it was a privilege that I was always going to go to college. It was a privilege that nobody ever wondered how we were going to pay for it. Uh, we weren't wealthy, but we certainly weren't wanting. And um, so when the time came, I, I went to Bucknell University uh, for two years and absolutely flamed, crashed, and burned. It was it was an absolute failure. Uh, I was in the wrong field of study, uh, doing the wrong things. Um, no, not drinking, not drugs, just studying in the wrong direction. I was a chemistry and biology double major, and then I added a music triple major because I wasn't stupid enough already. And after two years of essentially failing all of my courses, or pretty close to it, um, my parents sat me down and they said, you know, we're just not going to keep paying for this. If if you're going to be if you're going to be bringing home Fs, then we're going to have to make some kind of change. And, and I thought that was particularly fair. In the second semester of my second year, I took intro to psych, and I took intro to psych for one reason. This is an absolutely true story. My mother forced me to. I had no interest. I did not want to take it. She said, "I think you'd be good in psych. I think you would enjoy that class." I said, "Well, we're not going to find out because I'm not taking the course." And she hit me, and I woke up three days later and signed up for psychology. <laughs> Don't ever mouth off at your mother. And, and I, I took intro to psych, and I got a C. I was unmotivated, and I was not interested, but there were a few moments in that course that, that grabbed me. One of the moments in that course was learning about Jane Elliott and the blue eye, brown eye, mm-hmm. eye of the storm, and I was fascinated by it. Uh, and and s- some other messages um, and encouragement from the instructors. And the next year, I, I switched to the University of Pittsburgh, and I did my psych degree in two years, working every semester uh, fall, spring, summer, fall, spring, summer, and really overloading the the, the credits, and was able to, from there, go to Pepperdine University and get a master's. Uh, From there, I went to Akron and and did my doctoral work, though I never finished my dissertation. And um, that's that's sort of the origin story. Uh, I thought I was going to be a clinician, and I tried very hard to be a clinician. And then uh, I was doing my doctoral internship. And then one day, I woke up, and I looked in the mirror, and I kind of had that, you know, come to Jesus moment, which is funny for a Jewish kid. And, um, <laughs> well, um, okay, so I'm leaving that in. That's yeah, fine. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I call Jesus OJ, you know, original Jew. Um, okay. And you can edit that out if you no, want to. No. And um, and I looked in the mirror one day and I said, "This is this is not where I'm supposed to be." And I'm not a big fatalist. I don't believe in you know everything for a reason. You know. But I just looked in the mirror one day and I said, "This is not what I'm supposed to be doing. This is it is too hard. Uh, I am trying so hard to be a good clinician, and I'm not a very good clinician. Uh, I'm adequate, but not particularly good at this. And if I'm supposed to be doing this, it's not supposed to be this difficult." I don't mean in terms of the work. I mean in terms of I'm, I'm always swimming against the current here. And when I finished the internship, I was I was really lost. I had no idea what I wanted to do now. And it was very discouraging. I picked up a course. I had taught before when I was up in, in Cleveland. And so I picked up a couple courses. And then I picked up a couple more courses. And now I did the, ad, the career adjunct thing where mm-hmm. I was teaching literally 10 courses in one semester. Mm-hmm. And I would, I would go. I was teaching at four schools. And I would wake up in the morning, and by the end of the day, I had taught five courses at four different campuses. You were the freeway flyer. I was the freeway flyer. And, of course, you know that even teaching that number of courses, you can't make a living that way. Right. You're, no benefits. No, nothing. Um, I think one college one time offered me a little money to go to a conference. And they said, you've been here long enough, we're going to give you a few hundred bucks. Uh, and then a few years later, I got very fortunate. I caught on full-time where I am now. Um, and, you know, all the stars sort of aligned, and I, I kind of got into that position. And uh, that, that's that's where I remain. And um, with all due modesty, I, I found something that I'm pretty good at, um, which is the exact opposite of what I was as a clinician. I wasn't very good at it, despite the fact that I so very much wanted to be. And it, it I tell my students, this takes a lot of you know soul searching. You have to be willing to look in the mirror and say, this isn't where I'm supposed to be. And it's painful, but that's what I had to do. Yeah, I am thinking about... Uh how your story can be really helpful to your students. Do you see them, are they, Eric just did a <laughs> session yesterday, we were all there, I think, anyway, about uh, about advising and just these, I'd call them sensitive periods, you call them critical, but these periods of advising yeah. that uh, where our students are most uh, open, where we can be most helpful to mm. them. Uh, how do you talk about career and advising and how do you use your story for students and do you see them ready to accept that? Are they open to it? Do you think it's helping them? So because at my college, faculty members generally do not do advising. Um, I, I, I try really hard not to toe the line of overstepping my position. When students come to me and ask for advice, now all bets are off. I can answer their questions. But I, I don't go in and say to them, now I want all of you to come make an appointment to come see me so we can talk about your career. That's, that's not my role. I would be happy to, but I would probably be overstepping. If a student comes to me and says, you know, I don't know what to do, you know, can you give me some career advice then? I'll share those stories with them. Students will sometimes say, um, why aren't you a clinician? I make very clear what I do and what I don't do in my class. I tell them I am not a clinician and I don't play one on TV. And inevitably, somebody will say, well, why aren't you? And and then I'll tell them the story about mm-hmm. how I tried to be and, and realized one day I wasn't particularly good at it. So that story doesn't get told in all the no, classes? No, no. No. Why not? I think it's my question. Um, I don't think I've seen an opening where I can bring that in uh, apropos of nothing. I think if the student asks, I do. But Yeah, because there is an advising and faculty relationship and barrier. Correct, yeah. correct. There's something interesting here. Maybe we don't talk about this. I don't know. Go. But you are you do something that I do, which is very a lot of self-deprecating comments. You, you talk about how I'm wrong all the time. Yeah. And, well, I'm married. And, I've been taught that I'm okay, wrong all the okay. time. Okay. All right. See, then there it is. You know, so, but I, do you, in the, in the grand philosophical scheme of things, do you think that ever backfires? If, if you are saying to yourself in that self-talk voice, I'm, I'm wrong all the time. I, you know, you, you you beat up on yourself a lot, mm. and and I have the same kind of tendency. Mm. So I'm, I want to be fair about this. Yeah. Do you think that? Do you think that has? Is that for show, to make a point, or is that the real you? I think it depends on the context. Yeah. Uh, so when I say that I wasn't a very good clinician, I'm not beating up on myself. I, I, I have the data to back it up. I know that. Um, but, if I if I say to you something like, you know. Do you think I have anything valuable to offer your podcast? Um, I think that's just, I've been taught my whole life, you've got to be very, very humble. Always be very, very humble. Err on the side of over humility. Can that go too far? I think probably. Yeah, because, you know, the, the first two years of college, with double major, then triple major, mm. but then to overcome that, go to a different school, mm. you had to work 
incredibly hard to overcome that GPA that had to be an anchor to be able to get a GPA at your new school to graduate. You had to become a pretty successful student. Well, I, I was, and uh, but you don't you I, don't tell that part of the story. I, I don't. You don't brag about that part of the story. I, I don't. You don't tell your students that part of the story. Well, the students I but do. I did the math in my head. No, the students I do. But also remember back then when if you transfer to new when you transfer to a new school, the GPA didn't come with you, so you got to start fresh with a new GPA. Yeah, but still, they, but they it requested was your transcripts. Yeah. They did. They did. They knew. They knew yeah. the type of student you were. Right, and and it was difficult to get that degree in two years. So no, I do share that with them and tell yeah. them. Them that uh, you know, sometimes it's very important to learn from your failures. It's important to learn from the mistakes that you've made. Or um, I, I, I was so decided that I wanted to be a medical student that I had to be a chemistry major, even though I hated chemistry. And I tell them, please do learn from from my screw ups, learn from my bad beats, as I say. Right, right. But <laughs> do, do you see what I'm? Oh, I know where you're coming from because Eric, you think that y younger faculty and. I think that Jason is younger than you. I think that I think you, almost everybody's younger than me, but okay. <laughs> but you see that uh, like up and comers in our field uh, do do a lot of self deprecating behaviors, or they or they chalk it up to luck, up, or they chalk it up to luck. We spoke about that yesterday. Um, yeah. So I I hear where you're going with this. Yeah. It's a theme. It's a very serious theme, and I know you're yeah. actually looking into the literature on it in the you know next doing some while. research, but. One of the things that you and I have spoken about yeah. in the past um, is the the push in this field, and uh, I, I think there's many levels to it. Yeah. Um, where are people most valued? Are they most valued if they come from an R1 four-year institution versus a community college? Right. Um, Antonio Puente spoke about this last year at NITOP, and he said we need to be changing that culture because we've got a lot of great people to contribute from community colleges. Um, uh, so let's, let's just use a, a vernacular here. That might be strike one. Um, then you and I have spoken privately about, you know, I, I didn't finish my PhD. I was not a researcher. I, I just did not want to do a dissertation. So our field says if you have a doctorate, you're at the top of the field. If you don't, you're kind of a, a, an also ran, so to speak, strike two. Um, things like that, I think, can, whether you're consciously aware of it or not consciously aware of it, do, does weigh you down into that imposter syndrome place. I, 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 think, I think that part of that is true. But what I'm, what I'm thinking about is that when you're, you're going into your students, you're saying, don't make the mistakes I made. Mm -hmm. But you could also go into your students and say, you can be the success story that I am. Mm -hmm. I did have some failures, but look, I turned it around. Yeah. So, I mean, you can also frame it a different way. Turn I, the message I, positive and I, constructive. I did have some setbacks, but I persevered. Right. I did. I had some of the same struggles that some of you might be having. Mm -hmm. I, I might have, I, I, I messed up a couple things early in my college career, but I made it through. You guys can too. Look what I was able to do. Right. I don't think that's bragging. I think that's being a role model. I haven't thought about it in those terms. I think we uh, have to decide, each individual has to decide yes. how much, how much self-disclosure we want to do in that's our classrooms absolutely. for the sake of students. Right. And I think it should always be for the sake of students. Sure. But whenever we whatever we determine is the right level of self-disclosure, I think this, this kind of thing can be used very yeah. effectively. I hear your story, and I think about how, how much that would mean to my students mm. to hear that um, from their instructor. And I think also what Eric's getting at is our classes, our intro psych class should actually mean something. I'm not talking content, and I mean even talking more than skills saying the person standing at the front of the class and their story and what they've been through and the trials that they've had and their ability to overcome and the, the character and, and the skills and the knowledge that they've developed over time, that has to be, if, if you want to, that can be a, an extremely powerful tool to use with students. And they may not remember much at all from intro psych, but they might have this new motivation or this new belief or self-efficacy or whatever. or my my students might not remember anything but they might remember that i've shared in my intro psych class that yeah i've been to therapy and yeah i thought yeah. it was helpful and they might not remember a therapeutic term but they remember wow my my intro psych instructor talked about how he's been to therapy three different points in his life and wow if he can stand up there and talk about it maybe the stigma is not as great which i have been to therapy at three different points in my life and it was helpful Two out of those three times, and and so I, you know, I don't I don't go in thinking I'm going to be a role model, but I 
I can accidentally kind of stumble into it sometimes. Absolutely. And, you so, know, if we say to the students, you know, what are what are the things that you think, uh, the, the stumbling blocks that you've had that you don't think you can overcome? Well, let's sit down and talk about that. Yeah. Either in class or come see me privately. Right. Um, and I tell them, I'm happy to talk to you about anything you want to talk about. I just have to be careful not to kind of stray into therapist waters because I don't right. want to do that. But Absolutely. No, well, I, that's I, interesting because I bet you have, you're really sensitive to that. Yeah. Just because I've got a counseling background too. Yeah. So I have had to learn with my teacher hat and my counseling. Yeah. Hat and I use that the same difference. terminology. I don't um, want to. I don't want to be putting on a counselor hat. But I do now. It, it makes a little bit more sense to me uh, that you know. I think that we get trained to put those boundaries in place, and it is hard. Yeah. To, kick down those walls. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially when we see a student in pain and that, that empathetic part of us says, I really want to help the student right now. Mm-hmm. And saying to them, I can help you by taking you to the counseling center. That doesn't feel good enough. It really doesn't. Yeah. It feels like we're turning our backs on them. Um, especially since now we don't have a counseling service on our campus anymore. Um, but that's, I digress. Uh, but no, it, 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 it's something that we have been taught. Always know kind of what hat you're wearing. And what role you're occupying, and make sure you make sure you stay in your lane, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. I I just I had someone pull me aside in the past six months, and you know I you know someone will give me a compliment, and I'll slough it off. You right. know I'll you know I'll so, something good will happen, and I'll say, well, it's because uh, no one else applied for something, you know, and and I'll and and what she told me is that every time you do that, you're you're demeaning the complimenter. You're demeaning someone has gone out of their way to say something nice. And I've really taken that to heart and started thinking about, I, you know, I've just got to figure out a way to not slough it off. Right. And, and to, because I, I hadn't thought about it that way. And I, I think, and I, I do the same thing, Jason, that you do. I, I, I'll do the self deprecating, I didn't deserve it, or I'll turn it around. Right. And, and I, I think that's what we, you know, I, I think in general, most of our colleagues want to be humble. Right. And I think it's a good thing to have humility. We don't like to brag. You know, we interviewed Ken Keith over a year ago. And the man cannot take a compliment to save his life. <laughs> He'd be drowning and you'd, you'd want to offer him a life raft or, a, or an oar or something. You'd say, no, He'd I say, don't deserve it. Oh, shucks. You know, I, I just don't deserve it. Give it to somebody else. Right. You know, I'd rather drown than take a compliment. You know, and he really sincerely means it. But, I, you know... I look around this conference. I look around STP. I look around Nighttop. Right. People are doing amazing things, Absolutely. and and praising you and praising Garth doesn't take away from anything I've done. It's not it's not a zero sum game. Right. So so I I don't know. It's I'm, not I'm, like I'm, Harry Potter where if one school gets points, the other school has yeah. to lose points. I'm I'm actually trying to walk the walk better yeah. these days, and so I I, I think your point is is, is an excellent one. Um, oftentimes. We think of if somebody gives us a compliment and we slough it off that we're just we're demeaning ourselves. But your point that you're you're almost unintentionally disrespecting the person who took the time to give you a compliment uh, is is valid. And that's what someone has taught me recently. So I'm trying to. So. So yeah. well, and I would say that uh, you know since we're complimenting each other, <laughs> Jason, you're in this role uh, as you are. What is the official role now? It would be regional conference coordinator. Right. That's the STP perspective on it, right. but. You are the exact right kind of person for this role, by the way. I mean, you, uh, when when I email, you email back. And so I imagine you do this. By the way, you're one of the fastest emailers ever. So that's great. I think people appreciate that. In I mean, he hasn't emailed in the last hour, so he's going to be slowed down a little yeah, bit by, know, this, by I, this recording. I, I told my students this weekend my response time is going to be delayed because I'll be away. Yeah, so. okay. But you All also right. think really carefully about your role. You take it very seriously. Mm-hmm. And you really want this teaching program at this conference to uh, be successful. Absolutely. And um, and so, you know, we talk about this a lot in STP world. People who uh, say yes to things and then they follow through on things mm-hmm. and they do a pretty good job of things, they tend to have a really long, uh, successful uh, career and a lot of long, successful relationships yeah. in STP. Especially those who want them. Absolutely. Yeah. If they want them. Yeah. Yep. Right? yeah when, I, when I got the email from Bonnie that... that, that this position had come through, I was actually down at the AP reading in Tampa, and I was in my hotel room, and uh, I shared it with my roommate, who had no idea what I was talking about, um, and I, I got right on the phone to a couple of people. I said, I'm, I'm going to be doing this thing. I, I have no idea what I'm doing, but uh, I'm going to do it, and they said, well, you're going to do it right. I said, yeah, I'm going to do it right. This is this is an enormous conference, a couple thousand people this year. Uh, it's 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 got to be done properly, and and uh, I think it's 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 a privilege to do it properly. Well, and see, and I love that, and so that's where 
See, so so that's the attitude that I love that, you know, thank goodness you didn't go, I, well, I, I can't do that. Right. I mean, I, I, I don't have the ability to do that. I'd, I, you know, I've never done that. I, you know, I, I just, I'm just not able to do well, that. Well, there's a little bit of that, but then, then I, but, I shut that off and say, but uh, even if I feel right now overwhelmed by the fact that I have no idea what I'm doing, I, here's something that I also use. I'm a reasonably bright guy. And reasonably bright people have done this properly in the past, which means I'm capable of doing it properly. And in the first year, I reached out to everybody who had been doing it before. I said, can you tell me about this? Help me figure that out. Yeah. And and the learning curve is steep. And once you get to the top of the learning curve, yeah. it's okay. And next year when we have new people on, on the committee, I'm going to reach out to them and say, hey, listen, I've been doing this for a year. If you have any questions, let me know. And I think that's very important. Yeah. So I'm interested in uh, the other things you do peripherally to your teaching. So this is one of those things. But I also know that you've um, done a lot of test banks. Uh, yes. On the, on the side. And right. I've never really talked to you about it. I just know that you've done it. Yeah. Um, I've never done that. But you you enjoy it? or Yes. I, yeah, okay, good. Yes. Can you... Can you talk about that? So supplement writing for uh, academic textbooks, uh, test banks, PowerPoints, uh, instructor resource manuals, student study guides, the online content. If you open a book and you see some questions midway through the chapter, I may have written some of those depending on the textbook. Um, I've been doing that for hmm, about 16 years now um, and have worked for a lot of the different publishers. Um, it, it started from one review. I got asked by a uh, a textbook rep, would you be willing to review one chapter of, uh, of an upcoming book and, and we'll, we'll pay you for your thoughts? And I said, you, you want to pay me for my opinion? And they said, yes. And I said, let me think about that, yes. Um, <laughs> so I did it. <coughs> they were happy with it. They asked if I would do a few more chapters. I said, you want to pay me more to tell you what I think? And yes, okay. And, and from there, they said, you know, we have a new edition coming out. Would you be interested in revising some of some of the questions? And I had no idea what I was doing, but yes. And um, it turned into kind of a second career of being a, a freelance uh, psychology textbook supplements author. Um, as the publishing industry is changing now, and we all know the publishing industry is going through a massive change, um, my involvement in that has significantly decreased, much, much to my unhappiness. Um, the publishers are doing different things now and, and working in different directions, and I don't want to mention anyone in particular or um, cast any aspersions on what publishers are doing to stay afloat, but um, there was a time there when if there was a major um, introductory psych textbook, nine would have gotten you five that I had worked on it in some some capacity. So, um, And I've made some tremendous relationships. Um, uh, Sandy Cicerelli and Nolan White, I met them by working on their book. And uh, now I think of them as friends and not just colleagues. Uh, Jeff Nevitt worked on his book. I worked on Dave Myers and Nathan DeWall's book, just, just a few of them. Um, and getting to meet some of these textbook authors at NITOP, I'm a big old psych nerd. Um, I love meeting the people whose names I've seen on the front of textbooks. Um, you know, Regan, I met him, for, I've known him online for a couple of years, but just met him at NITOP in January for the first time. And today I brought his book with him and I asked him to sign it for me because that, that really means something to me. Uh, psych nerd, but love it. Uh, Eric knows what you're talking about. I do, indeed. Yeah. 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 I have people sign like books nerd. for me. Yeah. And I, in my office, I have a shelf. I call it my shelf of fame. And it's mm -hmm. got a lot of the textbooks that I've worked on in the past. Um, and uh, uh, we know that a lot of the textbooks now are going digital. Um, so the, that shelf is not getting heavy at the rate that it used to. <laughs> but um, that's work that I really enjoy doing. If, if I see a string on uh, the STP Facebook group and somebody says, you know, I was using this supplement for this book, and does anybody have any thoughts? And I'll write to that person. I'll say, you know, how did you find that supplement? Was it good? And, and uh, you know, I worked on that. I'd love to know if you have any feedback on that. Um, but I enjoy that. I mean, I like knowing that my influence is, you know, if, if an instructor is writing an exam using a test bank that I either wrote or revised or contributed to, I like knowing that in some very small fashion, I'm in their classroom with them. Um, and that's, that's been very fulfilling. I enjoy doing it. The creative juices haven't run dry yet, but at some point they may. We're just about a, at about an hour. Is there a session in here? At the, uh, there is a session at the top of the hour. Yeah, at uh, at eleven. So we should probably, probably we should probably minutes. wrap it up so they can get the room set. And so, any last thoughts that you want to add, Jason? Uh, I've, I've been a big fan of the podcast. Very, very well, we appreciate to be, that. Uh, be a part of it. Thanks for making the time for us this morning. We know it's uh, the the middle of day two at EPA, twenty nineteen. Garth, anything? No, it was a pleasure to sit down with you. Um, I. I really appreciate where this conversation went. I think it was a helpful reminder, uh, not only, uh, I think,
speak to the three of us in here, but probably to every instructor out there who is uh, looking for reasons to give themselves a pat on the back, because I think sometimes we need to. Uh, we need to recognize what we're doing well. And uh, it's admirable uh, how you engage in the tasks that you do and uh, how you follow them through to completion. Um, so yeah, thanks for all your contributions. And someday, maybe you won't say that you're making a small contribution. Mm. Maybe you'll be able to wrap your head about that you're making more than a small contribution. Thank you for that. Thank you for being our guest. Mm -hmm.